Thank you, Madam President. I want to thank my colleague from North Dakota and Ohio and Wyoming and Iowa have spoken before me and my colleague from Kansas after me. Uh, I think Senator Portman ended his statement by saying, we've heard the rhetoric, but we haven't seen the actions. Well, in North Carolina, our state motto in Latin is esse quam videri. It means to be rather than to seem. And I think our state model does a good job of su summarizing the first 100 days of the Biden administration. As a presidential candidate, Joe Biden made it seem he would govern as a moderate, pragmatic deal maker. And he set the bar high in his inaugural address. He said, my whole soul is in this, bringing America together, uniting our people, and uniting our nation. I ask every American to join me in this cause. I was actually inspired by that statement, and I'm one of, the, one of the Americans who was willing to work for him on that cause. In fact, I was one of 10 Republicans that had the first official meeting with the president to see if we could come to common ground on the COVID relief package after having successfully passed five bipartisan COVID relief packages in the last Congress. Unfortunately, the president's actions have not corresponded with his promises to date. Instead of leading on his instincts to bring America together, President Biden has followed his advisor's recommendations to go it alone. He's pushed a highly partisan, ideologically driven agenda. And you don't need to take my word for it. New York Representative Ocasio-Cortez recently declared that President Biden has exceeded the expectations of progressives. Indeed, there's been a lot in Biden's agenda for the left to like. It's an agenda designed to pass with no need for moderation and not a single Republican vote. No consensus whatsoever. Proposing tax hikes on American families and businesses at a time that they're trying to rebound from the pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in the middle of a national emergency. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We have spent and appropriated billions of dollars to health care, to businesses to recover. And now, long before the pandemic's been declared, or the emergency, national emergency's been declared done, we're talking about taking those same dollars away. Offering mixed messaging and failed policies that have caused a humanitarian and security crisis at the southern border is another issue. When I went down to the border about a month ago, the press secretary said, it's not a crisis, it's a situation. Now a month later, the press secretary and the administration says it's a crisis, but now it's a catastrophe. I saw a dead body floating in the Rio Grande River. Other people have died. We heard the report of the nine-year-old. That doesn't even count the number of people who die along the way. It also doesn't count the three or 400 people who are called the gotaways, not the thousands who are coming in and, and going to the border agents, but the hundreds every night who are crossing. They have, they're, they're bad actors, they're drug, uh, many of them are gang members or they're smuggling drugs, human traffickers that are evading arrest. It's creating a dangerous situation, it's a catastrophe. The president hasn't spoken on it. To my knowledge, the vice president's never gone down there to actually get a bird's eye view. The president's embraced the Green New Deal policies like canceling the Keystone Pipeline. That one stroke of a pen ended thousands of labor union jobs, good paying jobs, but even more heartbreaking is that the communities that would have benefited from all of that commerce occurring in some of the most rural areas and most economically challenged areas in our country. They rammed through an entirely partisan $2 trillion spending package. They called it COVID relief, but only about 9% of it actually had anything to do with continuing to recover from the damage that COVID has caused this country. And now, I'm sure the president will talk about it tonight, a $2.3 trillion, air quotes, infrastructure bill that isn't actually an infrastructure bill. In fact, they've been a little bit more intellectually honest. Now they're calling it human infrastructure. Well, I think most Americans, when you think about infrastructure, you think about roads, you think about bridges, you think about broadband, you don't think about human infrastructure. 
But that's what's being pitched today, and it's being pitched on a partisan basis without even attempting to get a single Republican vote. Americans did not elect President Biden to enact any of these partisan policies. They trusted him to come in and make deals, to settle for something less than 100 percent, but something that was going to be embraced by more of the American people versus half, which is about where the president is today. And he's pursued this for the first 100 days. I hope he changes minds, changes his mind. But here's one reason why I'm not optimistic. His most audacious action, in my opinion, is placating the far left and entertaining the idea of nuking the Senate legislative filibuster. In this very chamber, 21 years ago, then-Senator Biden declared that defending the filibuster was about defending compromise and moderation, the promises he made on the campaign trail, the promise he made on the day of his inauguration. He noted that, that his speech was one of the most important he would ever give as senator defending the filibuster. It's a shame that President Biden isn't demonstrating the same political courage that Senator Biden did two decades earlier. The kind of courage that we're seeing today demonstrated by Senators Manchin and Senator Sinema. Instead, the president has entertained the far left's push to eliminate the filibuster and destroy this institution. To end bipartisanship and compromise is really no longer a necessity. So that any piece of le fringe legislation can pass with a simple majority. The president, a 30 plus year defender of the filibuster, should know better than anyone. He knows that the left is demanding a Faustian bargain. Trading two years for the far left to have free reign in exchange for permanent destabilization of our republic, emboldening future demagogues on both ends of the spectrum. Our country doesn't need more partisan pandering or political brinksmanship from this administration or from either party. That's why I stood against nuking the filibuster about three years ago, and I will as long as I'm a U.S. Senator. There are plenty of Republicans like me who are willing to work with President Biden and even put some of our supporters out of their, com out of their comfort zone for the good of this nation. In fact, when I was sworn in, I said I'd work to find common ground in areas where we may agree, and I'd vigorously oppose policies where we do not. Unfortunately, to this point, I've only had the opportunity to do the latter. The willingness to negotiate has only been a one-way street on the part of Republicans. I went to the White House to try and find common ground on another bipartisan COVID package. But it's ultimately up to the president whether he leads on bipartisanship instincts or follows his advisors who are pushing him to keep governing from the left. Quite frankly, it doesn't matter what the president says about bipartisanship and uniting the country, it's what he does. And tonight, I hope we'll see it for the good of our great nation. Thank you, Madam President.